I've read well over 100 self-help and personal development books. I'm not sure whether I should be proud of that or not because it kind of puts me in the category of self-help junkie, but I've done it over the past decade, so it's not like I'm reading 100 per year. Out of the 100 plus books that I read, most of them weren't that great, but some of them changed my life forever. And I'm gonna share what those are in this video along with some valuable lessons from them. Now, the first book is Seeking Wisdom from Darwin to Munger by Peter Bevelin. This book, if you haven't figured it out already, is about wisdom. It's about decision making, mental models, cognitive biases. It's about thinking and acting in a better, more efficient way. This is not a single idea book like a lot of modern bestsellers are where they take one idea and just repeat it again and again and again with different stories. It's not like that at all. It's one of those books that you can come back to time and time again and read specific sections and kind of use as like a, a reference book of sorts. But if I had to sum the book up as a single idea, it would be the psychology of misjudgment. Why do we make poor judgments, bad decisions, and how can we avoid doing so? The book tackles this over four parts. What influences our thinking? The psychology of misjudgments. The physics and mathematics of misjudgments. So things like systems thinking, scale and limits, probabilities. It's not as technical as it sounds. And then guidelines to better thinking, some actionable tactics and principles that we can apply to our own lives. Now, one of my favorite ideas from this book is status quo and do nothing syndrome. Bevelin writes, we prefer to keep things the way they are. We resist change and prefer effort minimization. We favor routine behavior over innovative behavior. Deciding to do nothing is also a decision and the cost of doing nothing could be greater than the cost of taking an action. Now, this syndrome is a consequence of our deeply rooted tendency to remain in the comfort zone, or stasis, which leads me to my next book, Breaking Out of Homeostasis by Ludwig Sundstrom. It helps you understand the system inside you that wants to save energy, avoid pain, and seek pleasure. This is the homeostatic system. The book compares two types of people, homeostasis breakers to homeostasis dwellers. You want to be a homeostasis breaker. And the way you do that, the way you become a homeostasis breaker is through body and mind mastery. Body mastery by increasing pain tolerance and pushing through plateaus. Not seeking easy answers to complex questions, but willingly embracing the gray zone of life. Knowing that there are no magic pill solutions. Avoiding chronic stress and minimizing unnecessary stress so that you can take on bigger challenges than normal people. And increasing your energy levels so that you can increase your productive output. Mind mastery through metacognition or getting outside your own head and observing how you're operating and thinking. Avoiding destructive mental feedback loops. Understanding how cognitive biases shape your behavior. Acquiring self-awareness and living in a state of self-honesty. Increasing concentration, willpower, and decisiveness. Perfecting pattern recognition, giving your attention to the right things, and throwing off the chains of amygdala slavery, or how to increase courage, boldness, and do things that scare you. This book is really a book about rewiring your reward system, chasing the things that are valuable, and avoiding the cheap dopamine sources that don't get you anywhere but keep you stuck in homeostasis. One thing you'll be reminded of when you read this book is that human behavior is complex. But while human behavior is complex, there are constants. We could almost call them laws or laws of human nature, which is the next book. Not only will this book help you understand yourself better and why you do what you do and maybe some things that you should change, It'll also help you understand the world and those around you much better. There's not really a single idea from this book that stands out because it's filled with such depth and wisdom. And I could make multiple videos on just this book alone. So here are three ideas that I picked at random while looking through my highlights. The first one is that rationality is acquired through training and practice. We want to move from unreliable, emotion-driven decision-making to being able to think for ourselves from a place of rational calmness. To quote Green in the book, your first task is to look at those emotions that are continually infecting your ideas and decisions. Learn to question yourself. Why this anger or resentment? 
where does this incessant need for attention come from? Under such scrutiny, your emotions will lose their hold on you. Second, escape tactical howl. As Green writes, tactical howl is where you find yourself embroiled in several struggles or battles. You seem to get nowhere, but you feel like you have invested so much time and energy already that it would be a tremendous waste to give up. Tactical hell is when you're fighting other people, you're getting stuck in arguments, but you're not moving things forward. You've lost sight of your goals. Green writes, our minds are designed for strategic thinking, calculating several moves in advance toward our goals. In tactical hell, you can never raise your perspective high enough to think in that manner. The answer is to back ourselves out, to detach, to gain perspective, and to reorient strategically. Third, Lose yourself in the work. You need to have moments of flow in which your mind becomes so deeply immersed in the work that you are transported beyond your ego. You experience feelings of profound calmness and joy. The more immediate pleasures the world offers will pale in comparison. And when you feel rewarded for your dedication and sacrifices, your sense of purpose will be intensified. Next book is The Way of the Superior Man. I think I've recommended this book to almost every male friend that I know. Uh, And it's another book that I read again and again and again, like once a year. Most of the book is about the dynamics between males and females in relationships and how to navigate them as a man, how to build attraction and so forth. I found it extremely useful for my own marriage. However, the first part of the book titled A Man's Way is more about just general personal development, how to operate as a man. Uh, And there's some useful lessons in there regardless of whether you're in a relationship or not. One of those lessons is to know your real edge and don't fake it. A quote from the book. The more a man is playing his real edge, the more valuable he is as good company for other men. The more he can be trusted to be authentic and fully present. Where a man's edge is located is less important than whether he is actually living his edge in truth rather than being lazy or deluded. This is expanded on soon after in a chapter titled Lean Just Beyond Your Edge. In any given moment, a man's growth is optimized if he leans just beyond his edge, his capacity, his fear. He should not be too lazy, happily stagnating in the zone of security and comfort, nor should he push far beyond his edge, stressing himself unnecessarily, unable to metabolize his experience. He should lean just slightly beyond the edge of fear and discomfort, constantly in everything he does. All right, next book. You may have read this one. It's called The Almanac of Naval Ravikant. And I read this first on Kindle when it came out, and then I immediately bought five physical copies to give out to friends. It was just that good. Some of the key ideas in the book that resonated with me were to find and build specific knowledge. So, In other words, for specific knowledge could be skills, particularly those that you're good at that others find hard. So what feels like play to you, but work to others. You should double down on that. Second, relentlessly pursue curiosity. Following your genuine intellectual curiosity is a better foundation for a career than following whatever is making money right now. If it entertains you now, but will bore you someday, it's a distraction. Keep looking. Third, Learn to love to read. Naval writes, you should read about what you love until you love to read. And also, don't overthink what you read. He says, it almost doesn't matter what you read. Eventually, you will read enough things and your interests will lead you there that it will dramatically improve your life. And my favorite quote from the book, the winners of any game are the people who are so addicted They continue playing, even as the marginal utility from winning declines. This is the book, whenever I find myself lacking clarity, or I'm not sure where to go next, or I just need to remind myself of some truths, this is the book I go to. So make sure to check it out. The next book is Wanting by Luke Burgess. When I first read this book, it helped me better understand the hidden forces that shaped my desires and my decisions. I figured out why I wanted certain things. I became more conscious of inauthentic desires, those that were modeled by others that I hadn't really thought through at all. And I became more aware of how to arrive at authentic desires. Burgess writes in the book, there are always models of desire. If you don't know yours, they are probably wreaking havoc in your life. 
And so if you're at a stage in life right now where you're not sure what you want, you've got all these competing desires and goals, then I encourage you to read this book. Because like the laws of human nature, it's a book that will not only help you understand yourself better, but also the world around you. All right, next book is Straight Line Leadership. I love this book so much that I made an entire video on it and a lot of people liked it. I shared five lessons that I learned from the book. Uh, you can check out that at the link in the description or it should pop up somewhere around here. Straight Line Leadership is a book about taking action. It cuts through the noise in your own head as you're reading it and that's why I like it so much. One of the key ideas in the book is that there are three types of people, circular people, zigzag people and straight line people. People who live in the circular world talk about issues but don't solve them. They get stuck in loops and cycles but don't move forward. They repeat past mistakes and they seek information but don't take action. Circular people falsely think that success is about having the right information. Dusan Jukic, the author, writes, circle people are running around seeking secret knowledge, always trying to find the next new thing. Zigzag people live between the circular world and the straight line world. They have moments and seasons of high performance where they are decisive, take action and get some results, but it doesn't last and they fall back into the circular world. Zigzag people start and stop, but never build true momentum. A straight line person doesn't chronically try to find secret knowledge. They simply begin. They do the necessary required actions to get from A to B. Unlike circle and zigzag people who are constantly trying to find what they think are necessary preconditions to act, like they need more courage or they need to fix something else first or they need to think more about the situation, straight line people simply take action. They know that decisive action is what ultimately matters, not simply thinking about it. Jukic writes, straight line individuals simply decide what they want to accomplish, jot down what the necessary required actions are, and then do the necessary required actions. You want to be the straight line person and this book shows you how. All right, next one. The Paradox of Choice by Barry Schwartz. You ever caught yourself being extremely indecisive and wondering why? Well, it could be because of the paradox of the choice. We think that it's a good thing to have a lot of options, that as our choices increase, so will our happiness. But actually, this is not the case. Quote from the book. When people have no choice, life is almost unbearable. As the number of available choices increases, as it has in our consumer culture, the autonomy, control, and liberation this variety brings are powerful and positive. But as the number of choices keeps growing, negative aspects of having a multitude of options begin to appear. As the number of choices grows further, the negatives escalate until we become overloaded. At this point, choice no longer liberates, but debilitates. It might even be said, to tyrannize. One of the problems with our modern world is that we have too much choice. And one of the key ideas in this book is the comparison between what Schwartz calls maximizers and satisfices. Maximizers are those who seek and accept only the best. When they want to buy a pair of jeans, they go to every single store and exhaust all their options before making a decision. Satisfices, on the other hand, settle for good enough. In the case of shopping for a pair of jeans, they have some criteria and standards, and as soon as they find a pair that meets those standards, they make a decision, they purchase. Schwartz argues that it is much better to be a satisficer, that living in such a way is not settling for mediocrity, it's actually an effective way to live, and that the alternative, being a maximizer, is a recipe for unhappiness, for a multitude of reasons. So if you're someone who struggles with overthinking and making decisions, then I strongly recommend that you read The Paradox of Choice. Next, Finite and Infinite Games. This is not so much a self-help book as it is a work of philosophy. The high level comparison between finite and infinite games is that a finite game is played for the purpose of winning and an infinite game is played for the purpose of continuing play. If you're someone who takes their work extremely seriously or you're so outcome focused that you're not enjoying what you're doing, or you're not really sure what to do or where to go, then this book is worth reading. It won't necessarily give you concrete answers. It won't tell you what to do. It kind of just presents these two ideas of finite games and infinite games. Uh, and then it's your job to think through it all, right? So one thing I'd encourage you to do if you're going to read this book is have a notebook nearby as you read, because inevitably you're 
mind is just going to start ticking and questions will come up and you'll start thinking about things. So you want to journal through that. You want to come up with your own answers to whatever question comes up in your mind as you read through the book. Next, very popular one, meditations. The cool thing about this book is that it was a personal diary of Mark Cerruti. So it was never meant to be for public consumption or to be published, right? So you're getting like his thoughts that he's just writing to himself. And I'm not going to go through what this is about because it's about so many different things. Uh, but here are three of my favorite passages from the book. Perfection of character is this, to live each day as if it were your last, without frenzy, without apathy, without pretense. You have endured innumerable troubles by not leaving your directing mind to do the work it was made for, but enough. If it is not right, don't do it. If it is not true, don't say it. It's one of those books that when you're having a hard time, you can pick it up, you can read it, and you can be reminded that your problems are probably not that unique. That even 2,000 years ago, or whatever it was, uh, Roman emperors dealt with the same thing maybe even worse. Next one, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. If you do any sort of creative work and you haven't read this book yet, then I don't know what to tell you. You're missing out. It will help you understand what you are up against, which is the resistance. From the book, resistance cannot be seen, touched, heard, or smelled, but it can be felt. We experience it as an energy field radiating from a work in potential. It's a repelling force. It's negative. Its aim is to shove us away, distract us, prevent us from doing our work. That's the first part of the book, understanding what resistance is. The second part is how to be a professional, someone who fights and overcomes resistance on a daily basis. A professional is someone who sits down every day and does the work whether he feels like it or not. He creates his own inspiration. A professional is committed over the long haul. He's patient and he perseveres through the ups and downs, enduring adversity. A professional is dedicated to mastery, to relentlessly improving at their craft. And a professional acts in the face of fear. Quote, the amateur believes he must first overcome his fear, then he can do his work. The professional knows that fear can never be overcome. He knows there's no such thing as a fearless warrior or a dread-free artist. So fantastic book. Once you've read The War of Art, go and read Pressfield's other books like Turning Pro and Do the Work and Put Your Ass Where Your Heart Wants to Be. Final recommendation is The Comfort Crisis. Quote from the book, most people today rarely step outside their comfort zones. We are living, progressively sheltered, sterile, temperature controlled, overfed, underchallenged, safety netted lives. And it's limiting the degree to which we experience our one wild and precious life, as poet Mary Oliver put it. I love this book. It's a super enjoyable read because of how it's written. Uh, it uncovers the problem with our modern comfort-centric lives, but it does so by intertwining this story of the author's outback hunting trip in the Alaskan tundra, which is an inherently uncomfortable experience. He shares the story, but he pulls in a bunch of stats and science and studies and other facts to back up the thesis that we are living lives too comfortable for our own good. This is one of the books that inspired me to get outside more, to chase discomfort, to do hard things and to live a more wild life. If you spend all your time inside and you feel like you're a little bit too comfortable, then read The Comfort Crisis and it will kick you into gear. All right, that is it for this video. Make sure to check out my ultimate list of books and resources. You can find that in the link in the description below. And otherwise, See you next time.